Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here at TradeAthletics.com. Today we're going to be talking about five tips to improve control for pitchers. So I'm going to go over each of these uh, in sequence and we're just going to kind of uh, get into the weeds a little bit on how to improve your control. So first off, let's kind of define some, some terms. Um, you'll notice I use control versus command. A lot of people use them interchangeably, um, but I do actually like this distinction for uh, separating control from command. So control is kind of the stability to actually uh, locate a pitch somewhere within the strike zone to be able to pitch within the strike zone but not necessarily be able to place that ball exactly where you want within the strike zone just to be able to put your pitches somewhere in the strike zone command is more the ability to consistently actually locate these pitches to a specific spot within the strike zone so we're going to be talking about some kind of general factors that are going to work to improve control uh, for specifically improving command. Uh, that's not as much the focus of this presentation. It's really just helping you throw strikes. Um, however, some of these strategies are still useful for being able to more pinpoint locate where the ball goes. So we're going to be talking mostly about control and kind of in generalities as far as mechanics and where kind of your focus should be uh, in terms of throwing strikes. So this is the fix that we've established that we've uh, we've discovered. Um, this is the one thing that you should say if you're a coach and you go to the mound and your pitcher is struggling to throw strikes. Um, this is the thing that you should tell them that's going to definitely fix the situation and that would be just throw strikes. So if you tell him just throw strikes, he's going to be fine. He's going to immediately know what he needs to do, uh, and he'll be able to get out of that inning. So uh, coaches, take note. This is exactly what you should tell your guys when they're struggling with their command and their control. You think you can throw a strike on this pitch? Yeah, it's not going to be much on it. My arm feels like jello right now. Just get it over the plate. I want him to swing. Last time I did that, the guy hit one that hasn't landed yet. Obviously, I'm kidding there as well. Let's get into the first actual tip uh, for improving control. Now, this is a mechanical factor that I feel is probably the most important mechanical factor for improving your ability to throw with control. And that would be to improve the linear direction to the throw. Now, you'll notice that there are some guys you've played with, some athletes that you've coached, that never have an issue with throwing the ball in the zone. And typically, those are going to be your guys who just naturally have very good linear direction to the throw. So what do I mean by linear direction to the throw? Well, pitching is a combination of both linear and rotational movements. Um, so we need to be able to ideally blend this linear move and linear move, I'm talking about the hinge, I'm talking about that uh, linear uh, initiation of your movement towards the target, whereas rotation is the pelvic rotation into landing, the torso rotation following that. So we need to be able to ideally blend these two factors together but that linear move is what provides that initial direction to the throw and it also provides direction to the ensuing rotation of the throw. So again, that linear move, that linear energy from the move and the direction gets converted into rotation. But what happens with that rotation is largely dependent on what happened earlier in the throw and the direction that we're able to create. So when I say linear move, I'm also really talking about the hinge. It's the same move. It's that forward move towards the target where your pelvis is closed. Your pelvis is locked over the femur. And you're basically just guiding the throw, gathering your energy, st keeping tall, good posture, and you're basically setting everything up for a good unload into landing with good timing. So the way that I like to think of the hinge is essentially your pelvis is locked over the, the back femur, and at this point, you've locked on target. So for me personally, I'll kind of think of that pelvis turning over the femur, and then that guiding the throw, almost as if I had kind of a laser pointer on that front hip, on that pelvis, towards the target. It's setting that angle, and it's guiding that direction to the throw. Now the exact angle of the pelvis, the exact amount of counter rotation of the pelvis is gonna vary a little bit based on your hip anatomy, based on your structure. You're gonna see MLB guys who, they have a lot more counter rotation and maybe that laser pointer is on their, on their butt cheek towards the target. And you're gonna see guys who maybe don't have as much hip internal rotation. and They're just gonna be relatively square to the target and that laser pointer might be kind of on the side of their front hip. But either way, Thinking of that as locking onto the target, it really helps provide direction to the throw. It also keeps it a backside driven movement, which can help prevent leaking early. So by staying in the hinge and having a good linear move and good direction, uh, it keeps that focus on the backside driving the throw versus on the front side reaching early. Uh, and that's gonna help prevent leaking early. It's gonna prevent early pelvic rotation, which prevents early torso rotation, which is just gonna keep everything in sequence and on time. Your linear direction, is also linked to your rotational direction. And what I mean by that is, if you can keep good direction with that linear move, you're also influencing the direction of that rotation. Whether that rotation yanks you way off to the side or whether that rotation 
drives you down into landing and helps accelerate your torso all in that same plane. Um, that's largely gonna be dictated by the direction of that initial hinge. So some indicators of if you are struggling with this move, what you're typically gonna see is that guys are gonna be missing side to side quite a bit. So if you don't have good linear direction to the throw, and I've experienced this myself before I really learned the hinge, uh, and even when I kind of uh, settle back into some bad habits, you know, throw here, throw there, what I'll find is that you typically are gonna be missing low in glove side or high in arm side, but there's gonna be a lot of side to side variance when you don't have direction to throw and you're just kind of lifting your leg, opening up and throwing. You're gonna either be yanking the ball down or your arm is gonna be a little bit late and you're gonna be leaving it up. So you're gonna see this kind of uh, spraying of the ball side to side. When you see guys with good direction, they typically have a lot easier time throwing strikes because they've eliminated that side to side uh, missing to a large extent. Because they have that direction to the throw, and they're able to rotate down into landing with that good direction, they're typically missing up to down, but they're gonna be missing very little side to side. And so it's almost this, this effect of, we'll use the cue sometimes of throwing down a narrow hallway where it kind of eliminates a lot of those side to side misses. So that'll be the, the key indicator that you'll notice. If you start to improve that linear move, you should notice that the side to side misses are really drop down quite a bit. Now again, all of this is a general rule. It's still possible to throw hard without a good hinge without a good linear move. Uh, it's just more difficult to actually throw hard and throw strikes. So the hinge is not only beneficial for velo, but it's just, again, beneficial for providing the direction to the throw. But that's not to say that you're not gonna be able to find big leaguers here and there who come out of their leg lift and they immediately open up with the pelvis and they're just spraying and praying and they're able to find a way to make it work. So again, this is just a general rule. It's not a hard rule, but if you are struggling to throw strikes, I would highly encourage you to take a closer look at if your linear move is an issue, if you even know what, how to hinge, what that move means. And I would look closer into that because that is the number one, uh, not only for a velocity standpoint, but that's the number one uh, issue that a lot of guys have when it comes to command. With my personal experience, you know, this is something that I didn't quite figure out, the, the hinge until late into my college career. But as soon as I did, I found it very, very easy to throw strikes. Uh, maybe not necessarily to command the ball exactly where I wanted it. Not even thinking about it, I would notice that the ball was roughly where I wanted to throw it and it stayed online much better. Um, versus before, I would have crazy misses side to side uh, my first couple of years in college. Um, currently, my general cues when throwing, again, I'm just thinking about kind of locking onto the target. So I'm trying to set my angle, set my, uh, set my sight on the target. Again, kind of that laser pointer on the front hip cue. I'm setting my angle. I'm riding the hinge as long as I can. And then I'm just letting the rest of the throw unfurl and unfold downhill. And that's really all I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking about where my arm is in space. I'm not thinking about what my front foot is doing, what my glove arm is doing. I'm setting the angle and I'm letting it unfurl downhill. And it's that smooth, fluid flow of energy that happens as a result of setting the hinge, setting the linear direction, and letting the rest of the throw unfold. So hopefully that gives you a general overview of the first tip and why a hin the hinge is so important to improving command and eliminating these side to side misses. So the second issue that you'll commonly see and the second tip that I have is arm plane and arm timing. So you're gonna have to learn to improve arm plane and arm timing if that is an issue for you. But again, these are very common mechanical issues that are very, very closely linked not only to velocity, but to your ability to throw strikes. So what is arm timing? Well, arm timing, we're really talking about the degree of external rotation at front foot contact. So at landing, where is your arm? This would be zero degrees, this would be 90 degrees, so this would be about 45 degrees, where is the arm? Now we define a late arm ourselves as less than about 25 degrees of external rotation at front foot contact. So somewhere around here, anything less than that, we would consider a late arm. And early, early would be uh, the arm is up roughly around 90 degrees of extra rotation up uh, more than two to three frames before front foot contact. So this is where you'll see a guy kind of get here very, very early. There's a pause, there's a lag. Now they come down into landing and throw. Uh, this is a problem as well. We'll get into that uh, in a second as far as why that's a problem. There's both the arm being late and there's, both the, there's also the arm being too early. Now, ASMI, American Sports Medicine Institute, has studied thousands of pitchers in their lab and the range that they've come across for arm timing for their elite professional throwers is 36 degrees to 82 degrees at front foot contact. Again, that's what that's gonna look like is somewhere between here and there at landing, somewhere in that range. So again, they don't need to be super, super early and they also don't need to be late as well. Now they set that cutoff at 36 degrees. Again, very, very close to the numbers that we're, we're talking about and just good to have kind of some data to back up uh, these numbers that I'm throwing at you guys. What is arm plane? Arm plane is referring to where the elbow is in relation to the line of the shoulders 
both at front foot contact and during the entire rotational phase of the torso. So where is that elbow? Is that elbow above the plane of the shoulders? Is it below the plane of the shoulders as you're rotating? Or is it right in plane with the shoulders as you rotate? Now, obviously we want that elbow to be in plane. We want uh, 90 degrees of abduction with a slight variance. So if that elbow is a little bit above or a little bit below, that's okay. But what you'll see is that if that elbow abduction angle is way down here at landing, that's not only an issue for velocity because as you turn, you're not getting much of that rotation into the actual upper arm and into the ball, but it's also an issue for command, which we'll get into that in a second. Now, if that elbow is way too high at landing, that's potentially an issue depending on the, the, if it's late as well. Potentially an issue for arm health, but again, also an issue for velocity, also a potential issue for command. ASMI also looked at this, and their range for elite professionals is 78 to 98 degrees of abduction at front foot contact. So again, right around 90 degrees, give or take about eight to 12 degrees on either end of that range. At ball release, their range was very similar, 80 to 94 degrees. So again, right about 90 degrees of abduction at ball release, plus or minus a slight variance of where that elbow is in relation to the shoulder. We talked about this before, I don't wanna get into it too much, but your arm slot is actually dictated more by the degree of contralateral tilt, not actually the abduction angle. So a high arm slot is not gonna be someone releasing like this. It's gonna be someone who has more tilt with the elbow in line with the shoulders. Again, five to 10 degrees, plus or minus that 90 degree angle. Now, why is this so important? So if the arm is in plane, the arm will actually follow what the torso is doing. In other words, you can trust that the direction to the throw is going to feed into the pelvic rotational direction, which is gonna feed into the torso rotational direction, and you can trust that the arm is gonna be in that same plane and the arm is gonna go where the torso goes. The problem happens when the torso is going one way and the arm is way up here or the arm is way down here, the problem is now that the torso is doing one thing and the arm is doing something else. And so you don't have this one fluid motion, one smooth fluid flow of energy from the ground up through the entire body as one unit. You now have the arm doing something else and the arm is now out of that plane and it's much harder to actually repeat and control that in most cases uh, when you can't get the arm in plane and or when the arm is significantly late or early. So some, some signs that you're gonna see if the arm is a little bit early. Obviously you're gonna see the arm is physically up early at landing if you look at it on video, um, but you're typically gonna notice in catch play that you're yanking or cutting the ball low in glove side when you miss. You can see this very easily yourself. If you play catch with a five ounce ball for a few throws, now pick up a four ounce ball. What you're gonna notice is your first couple of throws with a four ounce ball, in most cases, you're gonna be cutting those or you're gonna be yanking those down in glove side. And that's because the four ounce is gonna speed your arm up. It's gonna get your arm up a hair earlier than it you would with a five ounce ball. And just that slight variance is gonna cause you to miss low and glove side. Now, if you have a late or a low arm, you're gonna find yourself missing high and missing arm side. You can see the same thing if you play catch with a five ounce ball. Now you pick up a six ounce ball and keep the exact same intent, the exact same focus. Um, you're gonna find that that ball is high in arm side because keeping the exact same timing, now the arm is a hair later because of the weight of the ball and that's what happens, that's the result. So if you're noticing either one of these in catch play, there's a chance that's what's going on that's just gonna kind of be a confirmation of what you're seeing on video. If you think you're having these issues, that's something that I would get checked out and I would formulate a plan going into probably preferably the off season to address these. These can be difficult changes to make to an appreciable degree in season. So proper sequencing, otherwise known as not muscling up. Uh, we're gonna define sequencing and explain why it's so important. So proper sequencing is important for improving control because it's basically allowing the kinetic chain to work in sequence from the ground up. Uh, sequencing is allowing, again, the back leg to work and the pelvis to rotate before the torso rotates, and then it gets in, the energy get, flows into the upper arm, then it flows out into the forearm, wrist, and ball. And so there's a sequential flow of energy, again, converting from linear to rotation and then up the rest of the chain from proximal to distal that you want to see and that, you, that you're gonna be able to observe in the hardest throwers when you collect data on how they move. Now the problem is when an athlete brings a certain segment that should be coming into the throw later in the chain, when they bring it in too early into the throw. Now I refer to this as muscling up. A lot of coaches will call this muscling up. And again, it's basically bringing in distal segments, which is gonna be the torso or the arm into the throw too soon. So before the lower half's had a chance to finish the hinge, before the pelvis had a chance to rotate and build up that rotational velocity, it would be, it would be something like yanking the torso too soon or bringing the arm into the throw too soon. This ruins the flow of kinetic energy and may reduce repeatability of the pattern. 
uh, because there's no longer this consistent total body flow of energy. Um, again, now there's basically two separate movements happening. The lower body thinks there's one movement happening and the upper body basically takes over that movement and comes into the throw, the throw way too soon. And so it's hard to have as much consistent repeatability when you don't have this one smooth flow of energy from segment to segment to segment. The energy's flowing great, flowing great, flowing great, flowing great, and now the arm comes in, takes over, and there's this, there's this jump of energy flow. And so this is more, more of a velocity issue, um, but it can also be a repeatability and control issue as well when you have an athlete that muscles up. Now here's a graph uh, from Rockland Peak Performance. Uh, highly encourage you to check out this blog post. I'll link that uh, down below. But just an example uh, here that we can see of two different kinematic sequences. So we can look at, okay, what is the pelvis doing? What is the trunk and chest doing? What is the upper arm doing? And what is the forearm and wrist doing? Um, and now those, are, those correspond to red, green, uh, blue, and yellow. And you'll see the pro picture on the left is keeping good sequencing. He reaches that peak pelvic rotational velocity uh, before he reaches the peak trunk rotational velocity before he reaches the peak upper arm rotational velocity and before that peak velocity of the forearm and wrist. And so he's able to keep this smooth flow of energy with proper, the proper order between segments, again, from proximal to distal. Now we look at this D1 pitcher and you can see it's, it's kind of reversed. So now he's achieving that uh, peak torso rotational velocity ahead of that pelvic rotational velocity. Now that represents basically muscling up, it represents the torso opening up early, the torso rotating early before the pelvis has actually had time to do its thing. Now I'd have to actually see each of these athletes mechanics to kind of really break down exactly what they would need to work on uh, from a mechanical standpoint. But just looking at the, the raw sequencing from this, this one graph, uh, you can see why that's so important. Uh, and this is, a, again, a common trend that you'll see. The hardest throwers have this order to their sequencing, and slower throwers may have good sequencing, but they may not. And if they don't, then that's, again, something that you'll need to work on. It represents that, that huge energy leak at some point in that flow of energy, in that, in that kinetic chain. So your indicators, of proper sequencing or improper sequencing. Uh, again, on video, athletes with proper sequencing, they're gonna typically look a lot smoother. They're gonna have clean motion capture data. But something that we've noticed is that their velocity ramps evenly with their intensity. So their 50% effort throw, and then their 60% effort throw, and their 70%. As they ramp up their intensity, their velocity correspondingly ramps up along with that. And they also tend to have an easier time maintaining their velocity past the first inning and, and deep into games. So when you see a big leaguer who's in the ninth inning still throwing 98 miles an hour, you can bet that that's a guy who has a very clean kinematic sequence because he's using the entire sequence, he's using the kinetic chain to create that arm speed. And so as he begins to fatigue, it doesn't have as much of an immediate impact on his velocity because he's not producing that velocity through active muscular effort from his arm. He's utilizing the connect chain, he's utilizing this uh, fascial uh, elastic uh, properties of his body, and he's not necessarily as susceptible to fatigue as a result. Athletes with improper sequencing uh, tend to look choppy at some point in their delivery. They might look smooth and then have one subtle lag or subtle uh, herky-jerky area of their delivery, or it might be a little bit more you know, extreme than that. So it kind of depends, but typically they don't look as smooth. You can typically see what this disconnect looks like on video. And a coach who doesn't even know what the mocap data looks like can typically pick out that there is a sequencing issue if they have a trained eye. Obviously, if you measure it, you're gonna see poor motion capture data. And then interestingly, we'll see that as they ramp up their velocity, 50, 60, 70, 80%, 90%, 100%, you're typically gonna see that level off at somewhere around 80 or 85 or 90% where they actually, their velocity might even peak at 80%, and once they get up to max effort, it actually decreases or it just doesn't increase much beyond that. Now that's because as they start to ramp past a certain intensity, they start to muscle up, muscle up, muscle up, muscle up, and again, that starts to actually lower their ball velocity. And we can talk about why that's the case in a separate video. Uh, Stuart McGill's had some great thoughts on this as far as his double pulse theory, and basically how when a muscle has super high force, it also has high stiffness, and so it's not able to uh, create the same velocity. And so the hardest throwers and the, the you know hardest kickers in any sport, the most powerful athletes are the ones that can combine this contraction and relaxation together uh, versus just sustaining this high force, high muscular tension through the entire movement. So the other thing that you'll see with athletes with improper sequencing 
is that they tend to not sustain that velocity very well because they're not letting that energy come from their entire body into the arm. They're usually bringing the arm into the throw too soon. So they're having to provide all that velocity from the arm. There's very little of the energy from earlier in the chain actually makes its way into the arm. And so you'll see that they typically peak in the first inning and their velocity will slowly decline over the course of a start. And we're not gonna get too deep into this, but how to fix this uh, in a later video. Um, but again, just, know, just realizing that sequencing can affect not just velocity, but your ability to consistently throw strikes. So the next factor that can definitely affect your ability to throw strikes and your control is internal versus external focus. So an internal focus is gonna be focusing on internal factors such as your mechanics. Where is my front foot? Where is my arm in space? Where am I looking with my head? Where's my front shoulder? Um, thinking about your mechanics is the primary kind of internal cue uh, that you think of uh, when talking about pitching mechanics. External focus is gonna be focusing on external factors. Uh, this would be something like trying to throw a ball to a certain part of the zone or blowing up the catcher or blowing it by the hitter. Uh, these are external uh, factors that take the focus away from yourself and put it on something external, put on some sort of external goal or cue. My experience, um, you know, both as an athlete and observing, uh, observing coaches and how they work with different athletes, you know, I think that this rule is, is pretty accurate. If you want to ruin a pitcher's control, especially in season, go ahead, give him three to five internal cues, tell him to be focusing on multiple internal things at once, and now he's worrying about where his front shoulder is, where his glove arm is, where his throwing arm is. Uh, that is a surefire way to ruin a pitcher's ability to throw strikes in season. Because again, all you've done is you haven't necessarily changed his mechanics, but you've changed where the focus is in relation to his mechanics and in relation to the goal. When you're out there in the heat of the moment and you're pitching, it's a big situation. You're saying, don't throw a ball, don't give up a hit, don't walk this guy. The harder you want to control something, the more it gets out of your control and you want to hit the outside corner with the pitch. If you, all you think about is, I'm going to hit that, aim it right there, hit it right there. That's the last place it's going to go. So it becomes very difficult to repeat when you have multiple internal focus points. And it also takes attention away from the execution of the pitch and away from the competitiveness or the aggressiveness uh, that's necessary to actually get good results in game. So my rule for this is if you're gonna use an internal cue, I would use a maximum of one internal cue, especially in season. So that might be something very simple, like, hey, hold the hinge, or hey, stay back, or hey, stay back over the back foot. Um, it's something very simple, and typically I like to use proximal cues, meaning center of the body, or cues that relate to the earlier part of the throw. So the initial weight shift or the initial forward move. Uh, the problem comes when you start giving distal cues like where is the hand, where is the front foot, uh, things that are happening out at the limbs uh, because the limbs are really controlled by what the center of the body is doing. If you can control the center of the body, the limbs are gonna take care of themselves. The arm is gonna go in a consistent spot. The front leg is gonna go in a consistent spot if you're controlling the center of the body. But the second you start focusing on these distal areas, it becomes much more difficult to actually repeat what you're doing. So over the rubber versus over the plate, um, basically knowing when are you gonna focus on these internal cues or your mechanics and when are you gonna focus on these external factors and just getting the batter out or blowing up the catcher or executing a pitch. And so knowing what you're working on on a given day. In season, you're probably gonna to need to focus mostly on uh, over the plate, executing uh, throws and catch play, executing pitches in your bullpens, executing pitches in the game. But there are gonna be times, for example, in your pre-throwing plyo drill work or in an off-season bullpen where you're trying to make a mechanical change stick where again, you might wanna focus on one, maybe two uh, proximal internal cues uh, to help you make that initial change. But the goal should be to get away from that as soon as that becomes automatic and keep it more of a external focus. When you ask what you know, the best pitchers in the world are thinking, usually they're not thinking anything. They're thinking, I'm just trying to throw the crap out of it or locate this pitch or uh, execute this pitch, get the batter out. They're not thinking about what their body's doing while they're actually out there on the mound. But when you have in the back of your mind where you're supposed to throw it and then just say, I'm gonna throw it as hard as I can right at that glove and just say that, it'll be around there more often than not. So when we have an athlete who's really struggling with control, uh, one of the easiest ways to impact that immediately is to simplify the approach. So when I have an athlete who's struggling, they just walked five batters in their last start, usually we'll have a conversation, we'll talk about, hey, what, where was your focus at? And maybe it's, oh, I was wor working on getting my stride online because that's what we've been working on in the bullpen. Or I've been working on getting over my front side with, with my release. Whatever it is, it's usually an internal cue. So we try to kind of change that and simplify the approach. 
Uh, one thing that I like to do is change the approach from trying to pinpoint specific fine spots in the strike zone to trying to blow up the center of the catcher. Now, instead of throwing to a specific spot, you simplify it to just blow up the center of the catcher. And now wherever the catcher sets up, you're still blowing up the center of the catcher. So it, all it does is basically change the focus from trying to be super fine with what you're doing to one simple thing. It's a big target that you almost can't miss. You give yourself a ton of room for error in every direction. And it sounds silly. It sounds like, well, aren't you just gonna be throwing balls down the middle every time? And the answer is no, because the catcher is gonna be set up to a certain corner in most cases. And even if he does throw it down the middle, if he's struggling with his command, he's not gonna end up down the middle because he's having this variance in where he's throwing the ball. Even if you aim middle, you're gonna end up at the very least on a corner. Switching the focus, at least in the short term, while they're struggling to giving them more room for error blowing up the center of the catcher, as opposed to throwing to a fine spot, trying to hit the catcher in his left shoulder or his right shoulder or his right knee. This helps reemphasize aggression and competitiveness and kind of take it away from the internal and just say, hey, go out there, do your thing, attack the hitter and blow up the center of the catcher. And 99 times out of 100, you'll see that they have a much better outing the next time their walks go down, their strikeouts go up because they're trusting their stuff, their velocity is improving, and they're actually throwing more, more strikes uh, just by simplifying the approach. The next tip I have for you guys is the importance of routine. Now, most professional pitchers have kind of been through the ringer, um, they've been through the ropes, and they understand the importance of routines, and most of them have routines. If you listen to any interview uh, with any accomplished big leaguer, uh, one of the first things they'll talk about is the, the importance of their routine. And they can go through their routine and explain how it's maybe evolved over time, but how it's this consistent anchor that they have uh, each start, each appearance, um, that's gonna be very different for a reliever versus a starter but the commonality is that they all have a routine. Now, routines are your anchor. Routines are that thing that you can go to that gives you this consistent mental approach, no matter what's happening externally, what's happening in the game situation. If you just went on a 14 hour bus ride to get to the game, if you have an injury that you're trying to work through, routines are that anchor piece that gives you that stability, even when there's all this other variability happening in season. So it's something you can go to when your stuff isn't working, when you're having trouble throwing strikes, uh, maybe when your, your stuff isn't there on a given day, your velo's a little bit down, you're fatigued, you've thrown three days in a row as a reliever, whatever the case may be. It's something you can go to when the game speeds up on you, when you just gave up a home run, you just walked two batters in a row, something that you can go back to and lean on to give you that consistent, stable point. And this is so important because consistent control of the strike zone is going to require consistent control of your body and release point and the only way that you can have consistent control of your body and release point uh, is by having consistent control of your mind your mind controls what your body's doing and then how you move your body how you control your body is going to control your release point and where the ball actually goes so controlling the strike zone requires controlling your mind as silly as that sounds that really is a, a fundamental component of this. If you look at, and I like to think about, uh, and I've read some research on free throw shooting. Um, if you look at any accomplished free throw shooter or any shooter in general, but especially free throw shooting, um, because it's kind of a, a fixed task without necessarily the specific time constraint, you'll see that there, every, every player has their specific routine. It's specific to them. It's what gives them their anchor and it's what allows that consistent release point for them. So there's a lot of research on free throw shooting accuracy and showing the importance of routines versus not having a routine. Now it's obviously a more complex task to, to pitch a ball than to just uh, you know isolate a, a two joint action in free throw shooting. Um, but again, to me, that's the easiest example to see how important routines are. So again, routines are a structured way to provide this consistent mental approach. Now we can break down routines in a ton of different ways but I'm just gonna kind of touch on a few and then I'm gonna link some resources down below that you guys can check out to learn more about routines and actually kind of uh, break down for yourself what your routines are gonna look like. So obviously pre and post game routine, when are you getting to the field? What does your warm up routine look like? Uh, how long are you stretching? Are you doing bands? Are you doing long toss? Uh, these are all factors that shouldn't be changing massively game to game and outing to outing. So once you establish this routine, yes, it can evolve a little bit over time, but you should already know what you're gonna do before you even get to the field. You should already know what you're gonna do after the game to prepare you for your next start or prepare you, prepare you for your next outing. Pre or post inning routine. This is also gonna be important. What do you do in between innings? What do you do to stay warm? What do you do to maintain your focus? Uh, what do you do if that inning lasts 45 minutes because your team just put up a 10 spot uh, and you need to still go out there and be competitive and not cool down? What do you do if a pitch didn't work that inning? Do you go down to the bullpen and work on that pitch? These are all questions that you need to have answered ahead of time uh, so that you, you have a consistent routine that you can go to depending on what's happening in the game. Pre or post pitch routine. This is arguably gonna be the most important of your routines. This is what you do uh, before you tow the 
the rubber each pitch. This is going to be what you do after you actually release that pitch. Uh, it's going to be important to have some sort of release mechanism to kind of flush what happened the previous pitch. And it's going to be important to know what you're doing when you catch the ball, what you're doing, how fast your tempo should be, when you're taking a breath. These are all pieces that go into play that uh, you don't really consider when you're, you know, when you're in high school necessarily but you come to see how important they are, especially when the game starts to speed up on you. I would definitely encourage you guys to actually write out exactly what your routine is and not just write them out, but practice these, especially in season and especially in the kind of that preseason phase when, hey, it's giving you additional mental reps and it's giving you additional work even when you're not having to put stress on your arm. This is something that you can practice every day that's going to improve your ability to consistently locate the ball and repeat your delivery. And then a red and yellow light routine. So uh, red, yellow, and green lights basically being the mental state that you're in as you're throwing. Green lights being you're cruising, everything's great, you know where the ball's going, you're, you're just cruising. Uh, yellow being the game speeding up on you a little bit. Maybe you gave up a home run, you gave up a leadoff walk, and you're starting to get that little bit of anxiety, a little bit of doubt in the back of your mind. Some sort of routine that you can go to to flush that and move on to the next pitch and get yourself back into green lights even when the game is speeding up. Red lights, again, same thing, but maybe you gave up two walks in a row. Maybe you had a four-pitch walk. Maybe you gave up a, a grand slam. Something happened where it's kind of this, this oh shit moment where your body starts to speed up and you have this natural reaction like, oh, am I going to blow it? Am I going to blow it? And it's in that moment, you can't just tow the rubber and just keep going. You have to have a way to flush that, take a step back, turn away from the catcher, and have something consistent that you can go to. Now, whether that's the top of the right, right field foul pole or whether that's the bottom left of the scoreboard, there should be something in every field that you can go to that you can step off the rubber, take a moment, regather your thoughts, have some sort of routine, whether that's a breath, two breaths, uh, a mental image, before you actually turn around and look at the catcher and keep going. So again, I'm not gonna get too deep into that. I'll link some resources for you guys to work on that. Um, but again, I would recommend you actually write out and practice these routines. This is often the difference when you talk to successful pro pitchers who have excellent command, excellent control, and the guy who just kind of sprays and prays. This is really the difference when you actually get down beyond the surface level mechanics and you talk to what their approach is. They have routines, they have something consistent they can go to. So in summary, the, the final things that, the final summary of what you guys can work on if you're having trouble with throwing strikes. The first is gonna be to diagnose and address any issues you're having with direction, arm plane, or arm timing in your delivery. Those are, in my opinion, the top three uh, mechanical factors that can have an influence over your ability to throw strikes. I would emphasize your smoothness and efficiency in daily catch play. So this is the easiest way to work on your sequencing to make sure that everything is coming into the throw at the right time is just trying to be smooth. And one of my favorite cues for this is to throw hard easy. In catch play, see how easily you can let the ball fly out of your hand and blow up your catcher at even if it's 30%, 40%, 50%, 60% effort. It's how easily can I throw this ball hard. Again, one of the easiest ways to work on sequencing, even when you're not in season, even when you're not throwing in the game, you can do this every single day. It's a way to work on velocity, but it's also a way to work on your repeatability and your control, even in everyday catch play. Number three is to shift the focus from internal focus, internal cues, to more of an external aggressive focus, um, focusing more on blowing up the catcher or throwing the ball where you want it. Uh, or attacking the hitter versus what your body is doing in space. That's time and place for both, but just understanding where that time and place is. And if you're very domed up and you just uh, are really struggling, then shifting that focus a little bit. Number four uh, is linked to number three, but again, it's simplify the strike zone. Think of it as blowing up the center of the catcher versus locating it to a specific spot. As you get comfortable with that, again, you can go back to thinking about locating the ball to a specific spot. But blowing up the catcher and just being aggressive is a good way to, to reestablish your ability to throw strikes. And then five is, again, establishing what your routines are and practicing those on a regular basis. Guys, thanks for watching this video. If you haven't already, like and subscribe. We'll see you in the next video.